<laughs> well, Clive, forgive the sense of exasperation um, as we hear, you know, loads of people in the housing market look to the heavens and say, here we go again. Um, but, you know, Boris and, uh, and the, the, the government have been talking about boosting the housing market by getting lenders first to accept benefits towards a mortgage and then introducing a new right to buy scheme. And now we have 50 year mortgages. Um, it's not a new concept. In Japan, they have had them. They had them back in the 90s. Um, it wasn't massively successful, and it brings with it a whole load of questions. First of all, do kids really want to have their parents' debt passed on to them? How are the kids going to be um, assessed in terms of affordability? When does it pass on to them? What about a parent uh, going into retirement and they can't afford it? What's the cost of it? What's the flexibility? There is a whole load of issues around this that that need to be answered. And part of the problem is that schemes like this, which are very demand sided, helps to keep house prices high. And in fact, something like this, especially where traditionally you, your parents, are, you, you're in a property and they might sell it and trade down. Now they're not doing that. So does that actually exacerbate the problem and mean that there are less properties available because they're being kept in the family? And who's going to keep them more than others? The wealthy. So actually, it, it, it probably plays well to a conservative voter, which I think is the point of all of this. But in general, as to solving the house price uh, issue and the housing crisis, I don't think it does anything. Oh dear. I mean, it feels like it does the opposite from what you're saying, that it, it's another one of these schemes where uh, you're helping people to afford the high prices. So that just keeps the prices high. Yeah, that's exactly what I think. And, and a lot of these schemes that the government are coming up with in terms of whether it's the help to buy scheme or the latest um the latest uh, tranche of schemes of which 50-year uh, mortgages is is one of them, it's demand-sided. So, so it's not addressing the issue that there is a lack of affordable housing out there for people. And really, the government would do better to actually, to be honest, they should nationalise a, a house builder, build their own affordable housing in places that people want to buy, create new places complete with infrastructure that make it appealing. Um, this seems a bit, it's a bit of a desperation to follow Thatcher's path, convert a whole new swathe of people to become conservative voters without really making sense or getting to the root of the particular issue that there aren't enough houses to go round. Uh, just on this 50-year idea then, I mean, I've read that th like somewhere like Japan actually does this, or they, they, they might even have 100-year mortgages. Uh, so is it practical? I mean, uh, you've mentioned a few of the potential problems, but it, it, is there a trend towards these longer mortgages? I think at the moment, because costs have increased in terms of house prices and now interest rates are increasing, actually, the idea that everyone used to get a 25 year mortgage has now changed. So a lot of people are now taking 30 or even 40 year mortgages because it stretches out the debt and makes the monthly payments a little bit more affordable. So there is anyway, over the past decade or so, there has been a move towards 30, 35 or 40 year mortgages. Um, in Japan, it was quite interesting because, yes, you're right, they did have a 100 year home loan that could be inherited um, by, by family. Um, and I think over there you saw that house prices prices rose. Um, and actually, a lot of people didn't actually pass them on. So I think the average length of a mortgage in Japan is, is, is around about the same here, 30, 35 years. Um, when interest rates eventually rose, house prices came down. So it didn't really solve the problem. It's, it's an interesting concept that might appeal to some people. But as a panacea that's going to solve the whole issue, I can't see that happening at all. No, I mean, I, I'm just imagining, you say, I could go to you, you deal with lenders all the time. I could go to you and say, well, mm. I, I'd, I'd like a 50-year mortgage, um, but I am going to be dead by the time <laughs> it's paid. <laughs> so, uh, but don't worry, I'm going to pass it on to my children. Uh, I mean, what would a lender think about that? And I mean, presumably we can't assume that family would even want to inherit. I mean, you wouldn't want to necessarily inherit a debt, would you? 
Well, exactly. And lenders at the moment have have more than enough trouble actually lending into retirement because what happens in retirement, Clive, before you die, and I'm, I'm sure you'll live to a ripe old age, is that your income goes down. So yes. your income that you're getting now is fine and it might be affordable. But what pension provision you have? What if that mm. pension provision doesn't quite come Don't through? Your, your income's going to come down. Yeah. And if you're if you do die, then how are your kids going to afford the monthly payment? How do you assess that affordability of your child in that amount of time? Because you don't know what they're doing. They might be at university. They might be out of work, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a whole plethora of questions that need to be answered. Um, so as a as a niche product, yeah, OK, it's 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 something that you, you can add to your your armory as a as something that the the prime minister is billing it as this is the answer it certainly isn't the other uh, last week you had a different answer which was that uh, you, you're going to be able to put your benefits towards uh, a mortgage what's the view on that one um well again that seems it seems pretty pretty strange really um i'm not sure lenders will like it i mean again you have a similar issue using benefits especially housing benefits or universal credit is not an ideal to base a mortgage on and even if it is used it's unlikely to boost borrowing eligibility that much to make a big difference and there's also the question mark around the eligibility full stop, which could change because the borrower's circumstances change or even government policy changes around who is eligible. So if someone is relying on it and it gets taken away or reduced, then there's a risk that the mortgage becomes unaffordable anyway. And if you have the savings available for a deposit then I think that actually that will negate you qualifying for the benefits in the first place. So it doesn't really make sense. It's something that's just said on a whim, in my opinion, and not really thought through. Um, there are some lenders who look at benefits and will take it into account now anyway, but it doesn't really make a big difference. So I think this particular one will be will be ignored and quietly disappear. And, and as you rightly say, it seems to be all about wooing conservative voters or p potential conservative voters because you can say, well, we've made you a homeowner. Um, and that, that's clearly what's going on in the back of, back of their minds, I, I assume, if there's anything going on. But what, what, we, <laughs> what, what we really want is some plans to build more homes. Surely that's, that's the bottom line of it, isn't it? We, we just need more built and it doesn't feel like there's enough action on that. No, absolutely. And governments and house building targets don't really mix very well. And it's not just this government, it's successive governments absolutely. going back decades that have never really do it. And and in my view, I think the housing market actually needs a long term housing czar, for want of a better description, that runs a cross party committee that develops a long term strategy. And it's not changed by successive governments or by the whim of the latest housing minister who's in the job for five days and has then changed. Yeah. You need a national programme of building well-constructed, affordable housing with the infrastructure to go with it. Where are the people going to go to school? How will the local doctors and hospitals cope? What about roads and transport links? So all of that needs to be taken into account. And that's not a four or five year term job. That's a 10, 15, 20 year job. And that's what I think that needs to change before the whole issue is actually sorted out. And you mentioned the idea of potentially nationalising a, a, a big builder or, or setting up some kind of state builder of some kind. I don't know how that would work, but is that the sort of thing we need? It is part of the problem that actually it's mostly in the hands of, of private developers now who don't particularly want to build social housing. No, I think that's a big issue, uh, Clive, and and some of them are better than others. Some of them are very good and they're very responsible and, and, and a certain percentage of all the developments now need to be put over to social housing. But yes, you're right. If, if you're a private company, then then what are you going to build? You're, you're going to build. We see it all the time around around London and some of the major cities. There are some beautiful one bedroom flats, two bedroom flats going up that are cost a million pounds plus. That's not affordable housing. That's not really helping to alleviate the issue. Um, but that's what some some builders are, are concentrating on. Um, the last really big 
building campaign was after the war and and that was uh, a nationalized building and 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 maybe maybe in the credit crunch a decade or so ago actually they missed a trick and and should have nationalized a house builder then um but we need to think outside the box now we need something different and um there's that famous quote that says uh, that I, I can't remember what it is the, the art of foolishness is is doing the same thing and expecting a different response mm. we we're, we're that seems to be what the government's doing. They're do, throwing demand-sided idea after demand-sided idea over a supply-sided issue. And until you have a joined-up, long-term, long-term cross-party policy, I'm afraid things ain't going things ain't going to change. What about repurposing buildings? Given that we've been through this big change with COVID, a, a shift towards working from home as well. Is there something in the idea of uh, shops, offices, uh, rooms above shops, all of that being turned into homes instead? And and would there be a problem mortgage-wise with that? Um, yeah, I mean, that that is something that's been talked about quite a bit, actually. And, and it seems quite a sensible idea. If, you, if you've got offices that aren't being used, can you convert them into into residential units? Um, again, from a mortgage point of view, it de- it depends. It depends on the type of building. It depends. Uh, flats above shops, lenders don't really like um, because they see that there's initial potentially with with resale, especially if it's above a restaurant or a laundrette or something like that. Um, but there there will be areas where actually you could convert an office block into into residential, and as long as it's done well and in the right way and um, and the lender accepts it, there, there shouldn't be an issue. Um, whether that actually takes off, I don't know, because what's interesting, what we're seeing at the moment, I, I work in, in London in the city, is actually people are starting to return to the offices. Yeah. So now actually it's quite hard to get office space again, certainly at a certain level. Interesting. Um, but it, it is one option and it, there needs to be lots of different options. I mean, the government recently uh, released a help to build scheme, which is actually a really good idea where it, it helps people build their own homes. That's quite a nice incentive. That, that That's something that, that could catch on. Um, but we really need to get all these random ideas together into one proper strategy. And just one other thing, whilst we've got you on the line, there will be other people listening to this and they'll be worried about their mortgage because we're heading into what looks like tough times ahead. Interest mm. rates going up, inflation, people are going to struggle maybe even to pay their mortgages, get into trouble. Uh, how do you see that going and do you have any advice for people who are worried? Yeah, absolutely. And um, it, it it's interesting. I, I'm just remortgaging now, Clive, and actually I, I winced when I saw how much my, uh, my mortgage is going up. Um, it's incredible to think that at the beginning of the year you could get rates – you know, below one percent, and now you're looking at two and a half, three percent. So there will be a bit of worry for people, but generally, if you're within six months of your rate expiring, it really is a good idea to start talking to your lender or uh, independent mortgage broker right now, and actually you can lock in early before rates go up further. I think things will calm down a little bit. Um, we've seen incredible increases over the past six months, but I think it'll start to even out. And although it seems a lot higher, you're still seeing rates around about two and a half to three percent. And in the grand scheme of things, it seems very expensive based against the last decade. But actually, historically speaking, when I started being a uh, being a mortgage broker, we would only we would dream of rates starting with a two or a three. So actually, I think most people, as long as they get sensible advice and do some sensible planning, they can mitigate a lot of their worry. And and taking a, a fixed rate earlier rather than later, making a decision now, is a lot better than waiting. 